From Tallahassee, Florida's capital city, North Florida Baptist Church presents the Family Bible Hour. Stay tuned for 60 minutes of beautiful hymns, musical groups, and solos with a special presentation from the North Florida Choir and Orchestra. Hear our pastor, Dr. Randy Ray, as he shares a powerful message from God's Word aimed at encouraging your life. Experience firsthand this time of worship and praise and be challenged by the preaching of God's Word. This is the Family Bible Hour. Thank you for joining us for the Family Bible Hour. Well, our series is the Ten Commandments, and we're in the second of the Ten Commandments, and we're going to speak of idolatry today. And we're going to learn some things, maybe a little enlightening, about what idolatry is, maybe what it's not. That's uh, this morning. We hope you'll stay with us. Well, I know this life is filled with sorrow. And there are days when the pain just lasts and lasts. But I know that.
here for you today. Stand with us as we sing together this wonderful praise hymn. To God be the glory. Sing it unto him. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Just 
I, you know, I, I just, uh, I was talking to, to uh, Jimmy uh, Roberts uh, this morning, and, and uh, I think uh, it was when Mike was practicing. He said, Preacher, I'm just going to tell you, per capita, we probably have the best singers in the world uh, in this church. And uh, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't disagree. <laughs> that, was, that was wonderful. I love to hear uh, Mike sing. We're looking at the second commandment. Uh, we're in a, a series on the Ten Commandments. Let me just say a quick word before we go on. <clears throat> that uh, Wednesday night Bible study, uh, I am absolutely blown away at your response to Wednesday night Bible study. We had a huge Bible study crowd uh, the first Wednesday, had an even larger Bible study crowd last Wednesday as we did part one of three messages on Islam. And uh, this week, we're going to uh, bring part two, the message of Islam. And let me just tell you, and, and I don't know if she's in here. I'm a little afraid to, to say since I called a while ago and got a wrong number. On, oh, there she is, Nicolette. Nicolette, I am bringing uh, to the service Wednesday night a glossary of terms, if you will, and uh, of what we did the week before. So you'll have all of those terms on a piece of paper, and uh, that should be of help to you. But uh, we're studying on Sunday mornings the Ten Commandments. The noted filmmaker Samuel uh, Goldwyn uh, didn't know the correct plural of the word mongoose, and he needed two of these animals for a scene and a production that he was doing, so he asked his secretary what word he should use, and she didn't know either. And so he thought for a minute, and then he said, okay, take a letter to the San Diego Zoo and uh, have it read. We'd like to rent a mongoose for use in a motion picture. And while you're at it, send us another one too. I, I think, uh, I love that. That's very inventive, is it not? Uh, there are different ways of saying the same thing. The, the second commandment seems to be a restatement of the first commandment, but it's really not. It's not just another way to say the same thing. There may be the same sentiment, but it's not the same thing. The second commandment is only possible when one believes in God and makes an effort to worship Him. I want you to take a look at Exodus chapter 20 and uh, verse 4, if you will. Uh, you shall not make for, yourselves, or for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, uh, but show steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my uh, commandment. This commandment forbids the creation of or the allowing for anything to be used in aiding the worship of God as a representation of Him. If you said, uh, I'm going to drive a post in the ground, and the post in the ground is going to represent God, and this is where I will bow to pray, and I will bow to the post, but the post is not God, it's a representation of God that's covered in this second commandment. That is idolatry according to the second commandment. The first commandment forbids anything to, by emphasis or design, to become a God to us. And the second commandment forbids anything to represent God uh, for us. An idolatry uh, command is what this is. I never thought much about idolatry, living, growing up in the South and, and uh, living in a preacher's home. I just didn't think much about idolatry until I visited Costa Rica the first time. And this has been many, many years ago. I, I don't know, could have been as many as 30 years ago that I visited Costa Rica the first time. And in the town of Cartago, there's a cemetery where some kind of idols, uh, there's some kind of idol is at every grave. And in some cases, the graves themselves have become an idol or a shrine. They become places where people go and they pray at the shrine uh, as a representative of the God that they pray to or, or of God who they pray to. Now, the reason for this is that the basilica or the most important Catholic church of the country is in the town where the cemetery is located, the town of Cartago. In the church, there are many images at various prayer stations uh, or stations of the cross, you may uh, refer to them, prayer stations uh, in the, the church. Uh, and, and it's like, much like you'd see in, in Catholic churches 
here in America in Catholic churches here in Tallahassee. However, in Costa Rica, as is in much of the rest of the world, Catholicism is at another level. And if some of you are Roman Catholic or you come from Roman Catholic background, I'm going to say this to you, and, and I'll probably say it again because we will look at Catholicism in our World Religions series on, on a Wednesday night. But I, I say this to you, and I say it with a true heart of love, that the representation of the Catholic Church in America is vastly different than it is in other parts of the world. It may be very similar in Canada, I don't know. But in Mexico, um, in, in Spanish-speaking countries, in third world countries, it's very, very much different. Uh, in the Cartago Basilica, one room is filled with gold and silver charms, sacrifices that are offered uh, uh, to the place in the basement of the church where people go and they, they pray at a rock. And they pray at a rock because a little girl was to have said to have seen, or was said to have seen the Virgin Mary standing on that rock. And that's what you're looking at uh, behind the bars is a rock. And on that, you may or may not be able to distinguish a very small <clears throat> statue, uh, and that is of the Virgin uh, Mary. Uh, there are charms made in the shapes of arms and legs and hearts and heads and so on as a sacrifice offered to the Virgin on the rock for a needed miracle. Now, with no, with no intention of unkindness, folks, none whatsoever, this is the very thing to which the Second Commandment is speaking. This is the very kind of thing that the Second Commandment is talking about. If you ever wondered what really is idolatry, this kind of thing would be included in idolatry. Now, uh, having said that, I want to talk to you today and give you four views of uh, the Second Commandment. We're going to look at it from, from four sides of the Second Commandment, if you will. First of all, let's look at the commandment itself. There are some misunderstandings about the meaning of the commandment. The Amish uh, believe that the second commandment means the forbidding of any image creation, uh, so they refuse to allow themselves to be, <clears throat> to be photographed. And they will not hang pictures, I understand, on their, their walls. Uh, that really is not the meaning of the commandment, but that is uh, an adaptation or at least an understanding that they have uh, of the uh, commandment. Uh, the commandment given in verse 4 is explained in verse 5. Let's, let me read it again and then the first part of 5. You shall make, uh, not make for yourselves a carved image or any likeness or anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall, have, you shall not bow down to them to, uh, or serve them. Now here's what God is saying. God is simply telling His people, the Jews, and us too, that nothing is needed to represent Him in worship. Nothing is needed. You don't need an image of any kind uh, to, uh, to, to worship God. You don't need to, to put an image for an imaginary God. God is real. He doesn't need an, an image before us. Now, there are two ways that idolatry is committed, making an image as a representation of God or making the image God itself. And God has expressly forbidden both of these things. There's some idolatry in the United States, but for the most part, we, that is those of us in this room and most people who watch by television or listen on the radio, most of us have never experienced firsthand what idolatry is like. We just haven't seen it. Uh, in fact, you may find symbols of idolatry being used as decorator items uh, in homes because of a shallow understanding of idolatry. Now, I, again, I'm, I'm not uh, trying to give your home an extreme makeover, but I'll just tell you, I don't have any kind of a Buddha in my home. I just don't. I mean, you know, it, when, when I was uh, younger, there was a, it was kind of a, uh, a fad to have these little miniature Buddha statues, and they were, in, they were in rooms all through colleges. And you remember that, Larry? They were, they were all over the place. And I never got one, I, and, and, I, you know, and, and I don't want one. And, and the reason is because I don't want anything that remotely appears uh, to be uh, an idol uh, in my, my home. As mentioned earlier, the, the Roman Catholic Church, idols are not prevalent in American churches uh, like they are in third world uh, countries where it's more dominant there. So, I, you know, the, the truth is 
that we just don't see it much here, so we don't think much about it, but we should think about it because that is the second of the Ten Commandments, that uh, we should not worship idols. Our frame of reference for what an idol is has become something much different over the past eight or nine years, and uh, that's what uh, our frame of reference is. It's American Idol. We don't think anything at all about American Idol, and, uh, and, and that is not what the, the Bible is talking about, but that really has kind of That's kind of the way that that if I said uh, complete this sentence, uh, blank idol, uh, most people would say American idol. And because it has lost its connotation with the second commandment. But uh, folks, uh, the second commandment is as real as uh, thou shalt not kill. And uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And we should not worship idols. In, In addition to the simple and straightforward command, Why is the worship of an idol or the use of an object to represent God uh, in worship, why is that wrong? I want to give you three reasons that it's just flat out wrong, okay? To to worship an idol or to have to have an object in order to worship God. It's wrong because it's unscriptural. It's just totally flat out unscriptural. Jesus himself told us how to worship the Lord. Here's what Jesus said in John chapter 4 and verse 24. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. That's the way that we worship God. Whether the idol is a representation of God or a God in itself, it is wrong to worship an image or use an image to worship. You don't need an image to worship God. When we must have a point of contact to find God, it suggests that our spirit is unable to find God a God who is <clears throat> spirit. So then there must be something wrong uh, at the foundation with our spiritual man if we can't find God in spirit because that's the way the Bible says that we're to worship him. We're to worship him in spirit and in truth. While the Bible uh, does offer that, that we can and should pray in some cases with the laying on of hands or uh, there's nothing, uh, it, it does not say that there's anything that is needed to represent or symbolize God. Uh, nothing is needed to symbolize God uh, in, our, in, our, um, in our worship of Him. And, and let me just go ahead and, and, and go beyond that a little bit and, and say this. Uh, I think that rules out prayer cloths. Uh, I just think that it does. It, you know, you can, you can call and get a prayer cloth, but if that prayer cloth is a representation of God and you need the prayer cloth in o- order to pray, then there's a representation there that really goes against the second commandment. Uh, I think it, it's, you know, I think in the neighborhood, touching the television is in the neighborhood. Uh, you, you, and it may, they may not do that anymore, but back when I was growing up, it was nothing for a, a, a preacher on television to tell you to come up and touch the television set and, uh, that, uh, and pray, or he would pray for you, or, or whatever it may be, or anointed pictures, or, or on and on and on it goes. A believer should be able to worship God in our spirit without an image to give us a vision of Him. Not only is it unscriptural, but it is impractical. Uh, It's an unscriptural thing and it's an impractical thing. I'm not trying to stifle someone's creativity about any representation of God, that any representation is is a uh, uh, of God, But, but the truth is that trying to represent God in a picture or otherwise is a false representation. We don't know what God looks like. We really don't know much about what Jesus looks like. Uh, Whether a picture or a statue, uh, pictures made of God or of Jesus, uh, who is the Son of God, who is God, uh, those are are just, that's imagery of what they think God may look like. Now, I'm not preaching against pictures of Jesus. I'm not preaching against wearing a cross around your neck. I'm not preaching, those, I'm not, I'm not preaching against uh, symbols of our faith, you know, a fish on the, your, your back window, uh, um, a cross. I, I'm not preaching that that is not the issue. W- what I'm saying is that if we have to have something tangible like that in order to worship God, then we've missed it. We've really missed it because we're to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, back to the thing about the, the pictures and all that, uh, y- you know, we don't have a picture of Jesus in our house. Uh, we just don't. Now, I'm not saying that if you've got one, you ought to go take it down. But the truth is, I've always been a little uncomfortable with them. I just have been. Uh, and, and I think it goes back to this guy that was in our church in Nashville. 
I went to see him, and, and, and they were nice people, good people, but they were just different. You know, there was a different tune playing, you know. It was just a different thing going on. And so they, they invited us to come over to their house one time, and Jan and I went over there, and, and, and he, he uh, I, won't, I, I won't use his name because Facebook is too easy to find people now, but, uh, uh, <clears throat> but, but this guy, uh, this, this guy took me in the living room, he's, and, and he wanted to show me something. He said, I, I want to show you something, preacher. I said, all right, man, let's see it. So we went in the living room, and he had this concave picture of Jesus. You ever seen one of those? A concave picture of Jesus, and his eyes, it was, it was like going to the, uh, uh, going to the haunted mansion, you know, at Disney World, and you're right around, and those ghosts are, um, blah, 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 and they're looking at you as you're going by, you know. <laughs> Dude, it, it wore me out now, I'm here to tell you. And I walked in there, and, and uh, what, as soon as I walked in the room, Jesus is on me. He was. <laughs> I, I was so thankful that we didn't eat in the living room. <laughs> now, that just, that just, that spooks me a little bit. I'm sorry. If you've got one of those concave pictures of Jesus, uh, don't invite me over to the house, all right? I, it, it, I'll dream about stuff like that. I, I'm not kidding. I, I really do. I couldn't sleep at night in that house. We shouldn't need a picture uh, to remind us that he is uh, real or that God is always present. God is real and God is always present. If, if you are really give it some thought, it is wrong in theory uh, because God is infinite. How can an infinite a finite person make a created image of an infinite God. How can that be? Uh, he did make himself flesh and he dwelt among us, but that was to sacrifice for our sins. That was not to model an image needed for our worship of God. As far as I know, he never sat for a statue. He never sat for a sketch. As far as I know, he came, uh, he uh, uh, walked this earth sinlessly, he died on the cross for our sins, rose again the third day, and nobody got a picture of it other than the recording in the Word of God. And so it is simply impractical to make God a graven image. Here's the third thing. It's illogical. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, what makes us think that, that something can be made with hands or accomplished in life worthy of our veneration? What is it that you can make that is so wonderful that you could actually worship it? That is the, that's how illogical idolatry is. The, the frame of reference most of us have is Buddhism, where there's a statue of Buddha representative of, representative of a, uh, the enlightened teacher of Buddhism, uh, and, and that becomes the object of worship, prayer, and sacrifice. We see it, but we don't... Uh, uh, we see it, but, but we don't get it. And, and folks, there's nothing to be gained from worshiping an idol, whether it is Buddha, a golden calf made by the children of Israel in the, in the wilderness, whatever it is. It is <clears throat> anti-second commandment. Uh, how many of you ever watch uh, The Amazing Race? You ever watch that program, The Amazing Race? My wife likes to watch that, and, and she's got me watching it. And it, it makes me nervous, to tell you the truth. It just makes me nervous to watch those people go run all over the world and all that kind of thing. But one of the things that the Amazing Race is that, uh, and I remember this, was there was one year where a, a Christian woman, they, they went to some temple, and I don't remember what it was, and it may or may not have been a Buddhist uh, thing, I, I don't remember. But they went, and, and part of their assignment was to offer up certain gifts to the idol of that temple. I don't know if you ever remember that or not, but there was a Christian woman who was having a real hard time with that. And the reason she was because of the second commandment. Now, folks, uh, that really ought to be the way that we view this thing. There ought to be something inside of us that says, you know what, that's a little too idolatrous for me. I don't need to do this. That's a little too much like idolatry. Whether it's from a, a country on the other side of the earth or someplace in our backyard, we need to be able to recognize and avoid and stay away from idolatry of any kind. If any one of us decided today to make an object to represent uh, or to be God in our lives, then begin to worship uh, that which we made, how does that in any way, shape, fashion, or form make any sense? 
Some say that the worshiping an invisible God makes no sense. But I will tell you this, it makes more sense to me to worship a God who is greater than me, a God that I cannot see, than to worship something that I made with my hands. I mean, I can sit down with a, with a piece of wood and a, and a knife and whittle out something and say, okay, this has become my God. But it doesn't make any sense. So the commandment is clear. First of all, the commandment. Secondly, the contaminant. Uh, in verse 5, you shall not bow down to them or, or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now to worship an idol or make someone or something an object of worship is to contaminate the worship of the true and the living God. It, it is easier than you might think to idolize rather than normalize the common things in life. It's very easy to, <clears throat> to get all flustered at celebrity. It's very easy to get all beside yourself at celebrity and even to idolize celebrity. <clears throat> Several years ago, coming back from Colorado, coming back from Colorado, we had a, um, um, we were getting on an airplane, I think in Atlanta, uh, coming to Tallahassee, and uh, Deion Sanders was on the airplane. <clears throat> sat, uh, I guess, sat one row or two rows in front of me, something, something like that. Now, you know what? It's pretty exciting to see Deion Sanders. It, it really is. I mean, Deion Sanders is Deion. But, uh, you, you know, you have to put a check in your spirit and normalize things like that. Because if you don't normalize those things, you'll idolize those things. And, and they will become something that was not intended to be uh, in your life. For years, for years I have said uh, that Tallahassee, in Tallahassee, what, you know what I've said. I said that we worship at where? Doak Campbell Stadium. That's exactly right. I've made that statement for years. And, and while I say that in a figurative sense, there are some in this town who really the only thing they worship in life, the only thing they worship in life is Florida State football. That's it, period. That is the object of their, their veneration. Now, the same thing is true in Gainesville. The same thing is true in Knoxville and Athens and Tuscaloosa. And on and on uh, it goes. It, it's like I mentioned last week. We take good things and we make them God things and we relegate God things to only good things. And that is destructive in our relationship to God. That is a contamination of worship. Don't allow anyone or anything to contaminate your worship of the true and living God. A distinctive of Christianity is that we do not have to go through anyone or anything to, to pray to or hear from God. Now, we can pray for each other, but you can pray for yourself because God has, has given you a unique and a powerful relationship to Him. You do not have to come to me in order to get to God. Neither do you have to go uh, to a statue in order to get to God. Neither do you have to uh, go to a post that you've driven in the ground in order to get to God. He is accessible. He will hear us. And no matter what the lodge, the church, the television preacher, or, or an author may say, there is no rite, ritual, or sacrament that must represent God before you can worship Him. You shouldn't. There's not. Our, our faith is contaminated by making worship idolatrous. We can also contaminate by worship becoming idolatrous-like, or I, I call it too sentimental. Here's you, for instance. If you can only hear from God where your grandmother went to church, then you probably made where your grandmother went to church your idol. I'm just saying. I mean, I, I know folks, I, and, and it's, happened, it's happened here. I know folks, there were some folks that I, I knew one time wanted to, to join this church, but they just hated to think about uh, leaving the church where their grandmother was buried. She's at that, in that graveyard. They just hate to think about leaving the church. And, and bless his heart, Junior Hill was there at the time, and, uh, here at the time, and Junior Hill said, said uh, from the pulpit, he said, your grandmother won't mind. But sometimes we, though that's not overt idolatry, it's idolatrous like. Can you understand that? Can you get that? There are even some who make the Lord's Supper more than it's intended to be. It is a memorial. It is not a transformation into the literal body of Christ. Neither is it a symbolic transformation into the body of Christ. It is, uh, it is a memorial. 
Again, it's what Jesus said. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we've seen the second commandment. We've seen the commandment and the contaminant. Let me show you the confinement. Let me show you what happens when, when we worship idols, how we confine others. Who, who made this statement? I want you to listen to this statement. We cannot mortgage the material assets of our grandchildren without asking the loss also of their political and spiritual heritage. We want democracy to survive for all generations to come, not to become the insolvent phantom of tomorrow. Personally, I do not feel that any amount can be properly called a surplus as long as the nation is in debt. I prefer to think of such an item as a reduction on our children's inherited mortgage. You know who said that? How many of you think you know who said, said that? Raise your hand. You think you've got an idea who said that? How many of you think it's Ronald Reagan? Would you raise your hand? Think it's, sounds like Reagan. It's not. These were the words spoken by President Dwight D. Eisenhower on January the 7th, 1960, in the State of the Union Address. When President Eisenhower began his first term as President of the United States in 1953, he was greatly concerned because the national debt was around $260 billion in 1953. Early in the, uh, by the time he died in 1969, early in the term of, of Richard Nixon, uh, it had grown by about $90 uh, billion dollars to a little more than $353 billion. Uh, and this was during the peak of the Vietnam War, and quite honestly, the, the bills that Lyndon Johnson left behind for the Great Society. Uh, program that he did. It took 200 years for our national debt to grow to $1 trillion. It took 200 years of our country for it to grow to $1 trillion. Now, you remember the bicentennial birthday of our, of our country. It's, you know, not all that long ago, really. It is now well over $14 trillion. Now, this is not an economic message. I'm making a point. We are confining our children and our grandchildren's future by what's happening with debt in this country. We are confining them. We are restricting them. With debt as it is, and if it continues, they will not enjoy the freedom that we know today. They just won't, or that we've always known. Now, I said that to say this. It is also possible to confine our children's spiritual future by modeling for them a misunderstanding and a misappropriation of what it means to worship the Lord. See the ramifications of, of overt or covert idol worship uh, to future generations as seen in our text. Verse 5, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, uh, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, watch this, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Now, without divine intervention, our children will become who we've made them to be. They just will. God gives stern warning to the children of Israel that continued in idolatry that he was going to carry over their, uh, uh, to their children the judgments that he would give to them for their idolatrous behavior. I'm just saying this. We have to think of the generations to come when we make the decisions of today. I am greatly concerned at the constraints that we are placing on our children's spiritual future. What, it, what is, while it is not idolatry, it is self-worship today that is running rampant and unchecked and by pastors. Pastors aren't preaching against self-worship. Uh, parents aren't fighting against self-worship. Society is not fighting against self-worship. We do what we want to do and what feels best to us. And as I shared a couple of weeks ago in our Wednesday night Bible study, today is the day of the self, uh, self-worship. Even in Christian circles, it is no longer about His will, but our will. It's, it's very easy today for somebody to say, we've decided to do something, we just believe it's God's will. And, and, and could I just tell you this, that deciding to do something and then saying it's God's will doesn't make it God's will. And, and I should also say this, 
that God's will is, a, uh, is an ominous thing. If God is moving you in his will from A to B, trust me, it is a big move. It is huge. The only reason that I came to Tallahassee 19 years ago was because God made an ominous move in my life. It wasn't because I decided to go to Tallahassee and say it was God's will. We, we have to come to that kind of an understanding, folks. In Nashville, I had a bird nest on the ground. I'll just tell you right now. My brother used to say I had a gravy train with biscuit wheels, and, and I did. I did. I started that church. You know, those, you talk about idol worship. Those people almost, they almost, almost made me their idol. Now, I came down here, and everybody had gotten over that. But, uh, and it's, it's never been a problem since. <laughs> but the reality is, if, if, uh, if you're not careful, you will make what you want your idol. Parents shamelessly indulge the whims, including the spiritual impulses of their children. And if God visits the iniquity of the parents on the children, what are future generations in store for now that we have decided in on idolizing ourselves instead of worshiping God in spirit and in truth? You have to ask yourself that question and be very honest. So let's, uh, let's bring it to a close. We, we've talked about the, uh, the commandment and the contaminant and the confinement. One more thing and we're done, and that is the commitment. Verse 6 but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me, keep my commandments. I know that we live in the day of God's grace, in the church age. But there is still a great deal of comfort in knowing that we can be faithful to God and he in return is faithful to us. You say, well, I think God's faithful to me no matter what. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. But I'm going to tell you something. When you're faithful to God, it's a lot easier to see his faithfulness to you. And the faithfulness, I'm sorry, but it's just, it's just multiplied. It's, it's rather simple. Keep God in the center of your life and do not represent or misrepresent him in any way. It will show uh, and others who know you, especially those who love you the most, will see it in your life that you have nothing that you're placing between yourself and worship of the true and living God. Nothing. I, I close with this illustration. Kierkegaard, a Danish philosopher, told a story about a goose who was wounded and who landed in a barnyard with some chickens. He played with the chickens. He ate with the chickens. After a while, that goose began to think that he was a chicken. He was in the barnyard with chickens. One day, a flight of geese came over and migrating to their home, and he gave a honk and, uh, toward them in the sky, and they gave a honk toward him. And Kierkegaard said, something stirred within the breast of that goose. Something called him to the skies. He began to flap his wings that he hadn't used in so long, and he, he rose a few feet in the air, and he was flying like he used to, and then he stopped flapping his wings, and he looked down, and he settled back down into the mud of the barnyard. He heard the cry, but he settled for less. I urge all of us not to settle for less than what God has for us. Worship him in spirit and in truth and pass that faithful worship along to your children who will reap the blessing of your faithfulness with some the same reality as they might reap the judgments of your spiritual failure. The message today is a call to us to step to a new level and how we understand and respond to God. 
Maybe it's a call to go home at the close of a service. Instead of saying, that was a good sermon, say, God was with us. Maybe instead of saying, I like the music, say, I can hear the brush of angel wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Let us rise to a new place where that, when the call of God to worship Him in spirit and in truth comes to us, we do not settle back down into the mud of the chicken yard and go to pecking at things. You have been watching the Family Bible Hour a ministry of North Florida Baptist Church in Tallahassee, Florida. If you would like a copy of today's message on CD or DVD, write to us at Family Bible Hour, 3000 North Meridian Road, Tallahassee, Florida, 32312. Visit us online at nflchurch.com or call us at 850-385-7181. Join us again next time for the Family Bible Hour.